On September 18th, two anthrax letters were mailed. Both came from New Jersey. One had the Death to America and Death to Israel letter inside of it, and it was addressed to Tom Brokaw of NBC. This wouldn't be opened until October 12th. The other letter was sent to a New York Post editor and would not be opened until October 17th. Two days later, still without any letters having been opened yet, on September 20th, three letters were mailed. Two of them were hoax letters sent from Florida. One was to Troxler, Howard Troxler, and the other was to Judith Miller. Troxler opened his on October 9th, Miller opened hers on October 12th. These were hoax letters. However, the letter inside, the written letter inside, had the same rhetoric as the second letter to Tom Brokaw. The second letter to Tom Brokaw also came on September 20th and was opened on October 5th. On September 26th, still, no letters have been opened, no reports have been made. Philip Zack, somebody who got caught stealing anthrax from a lab in Maryland, sends a letter to the Justice Department blaming Ayat Assad. That letter is open on October 2nd. How this person knew about anthrax attacks and who to blame it on is a mystery because there hadn't been any reporting on the anthrax attacks yet. Also on October 2nd, the Patriot Act is introduced, and it is opposed by Senator Daschle and Senator Leahy, who are in position to prevent it from passing. Leahy is the chairman of the Judicial Committee and can block the bill. Dashiell is also in a position to block the bill. Dashiell and Leahy opposed the Patriot Act on October 6th and sometime between October 6th and 9th, we can't be sure because the 7th was Sunday and the 8th was Columbus Day, anthrax was mailed to Tom Dashiell and Patrick Leahy and it was the deadliest anthrax so far it meant to kill them. Dashiell would open his letter out on October 15th and Leahy's, because it was misrooted, would not be opened until November. At least one other anthrax letter had been mailed about September 21st or 23rd. They're not sure because it had already been opened and was in the bag of mail and contaminated all the rest of the letters, so they don't have a clear postmark. But around that date, it gets opened on October 3rd, causes several people to get sick, and on October 4th, Robert Stephen dies from anthrax, the first person to die from anthrax in the U.S. since the 1970s. And on October 5th, it is reported in the news. This is the first report in the news about the anthrax. James Woolsey, Judith Miller, Gary Schmidt, Robert Kagan, William Crystal will all be blaming it on Iraq. On October 15th, John McCain will go on David Letterman associating Iraq to Al-Qaeda. If I could just remember very quickly, the second phase is Iraq. Uh, there is some indication, and I don't have the conclusions, but some of this anthrax may, and I emphasize may, have come, in from, come from Iraq. Was right? Bin Laden did not have the authority or power to force FBI agents off of his trail. Bin Laden didn't have the means to set up a false flag and steal anthrax from within American labs and take credit for it with his hijackers and associate it to Iraq to falsely lead America into believing that Iraq and Al-Qaeda were together and start a war there to bog down American forces. The U.S. and Israel did that all on their own. Karl Rove once professed that it didn't matter what reality was because they could make reality. And that's exactly what they did and what they rephrased as message force multipliers, an old tactic borrowed from Nazi propaganda about repeating a lie enough times until the most prejudiced or insecure among the populace start to believe it. If they can get five or six people to repeat the same lines in different places in the press, regardless of how lacking in evidence the claims are, it will create the perception that everybody is saying X, so X must be true. This limbing effect works particularly well with scare tactics and it is used over and over by the mass media as a form of deception or distraction. Here is who all kept repeating the Iraq is with Al-Qaeda lie, as well as the compounding lies that they merged with it. Once again, not a shred of evidence to back any of this up. Pure scare tactics, same as the Iran is going to build a nuclear bomb propaganda. Intelligence relating to the, Al the Iraq-Al-Qaeda relationship was manipulated by high-ranking officials in the Department of Defense to support the administration's decision to invade Iraq 
when the intelligence assessments of the professional analysts of the intelligence community did not provide the desired compelling case. These monstrous lies were told by embedded Zionist journalists who worked with the administration's PNAC members. For example, the lie that the lead hijacker of 9-11, Mohammed Atta, met with agents of Saddam was repeated by William Sapphire of the New York Times, May 9, 2002, which came from PNAC's Gary Schmidt, who wrote in 2001 for the Weekly Standard, an outfit run by PNAC's co-founders Crystal and Kagan. The story was leaked to Rutgers September 18, 2001, just a week after 9-11 and the same day as the first anthrax mailing. Wow, they knew about the lead hijacker as well as a meeting that never took place within seven days. They probably wanted to follow up on this sooner than they did adding the anthrax part of the lie assuming the first letter would be opened in just a couple of days but the mail didn't work like that. Reminds me of the BBC report plagiarized from a college student in California. This Atta met with Iraqi intelligence lie was repeated by Vice President Dick Cheney December 9, 2001 on national television. He later denied it in spite of being on tape saying it. You have said in the past that it was, quote, pretty well confirmed. No, I never said that. Okay. I, I never think said that, that is... No, absolutely not. What I said was, uh, it's been pretty well confirmed that he did go to Prague and he did meet with uh, a senior official of the Iraqi intelligence service in Czechoslovakia last year. He also ignorantly called the Czech Republic Czechoslovakia. One would think that if they had a report from a country that they would at least know the proper name for that country, but he didn't. In Czechoslovakia. What's sad is Cheney's considered to be one of the smarter ones. And he is, for a neocon. I mean, the competition isn't fierce. Gary Schmidt of PNAC wrote, Shortly before getting on a plane to fly to New Jersey from Europe in June 2000, Mohammed Atta, the lead hijacker of the first jet airliner to slam into the World Trade Center and apparently the lead conspirator in the attacks of September 11th, met with a senior Iraqi intelligence official. This was no chance encounter. Rather than take a flight from Germany, where he had been living, Atta traveled to Prague, almost certainly for the purpose of meeting there with Iraqi intelligence operatives Ahmad Samir Ahani. This was a complete lie designed to connect Al-Qaeda to Iraq and thus Iraq to the 9-11 attacks. It was false. Yet all the corporate news networks repeated it anyway because it had been in the New York Times. Of course, the Prince of Darkness was a message force multiplier. December 28, 2001, in an op-ed New York Times, Richard Pearl wrote, We must strike Iraq. Evidence of a meeting in Prague between a senior Iraqi intelligence agent and Mohammed Atta, the September 11th ringleader, is convincing. Another PNAC troll, Paul Wolfowitz, added, Like the meeting of Mohammed Atta with Iraqi officials in Prague, I think the premise of a policy has to be we can't afford to wait for proof beyond a reasonable doubt. February 23, 2002, the San Francisco Chronicle. Pearl was the chairman of the Defense Policy Board in the DOD and involved in too many other criminal activities to get into just yet. Paul Wolfowitz was the Deputy Secretary of Defense and later the head of the World Bank, and also involved in too many crimes to get into just yet. I'll let you hear the words of Francis Boyle in an interview with Boiling Frogs Post, the man who drafted the Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989, Harvard Law School grad, professor at the University of Illinois. We've never met, but he's coming up with the same conclusions. Get an updated list from the, uh, from the CIA. Um, and he said, well, we were working with uh, people at uh, Fort Detrick on this matter. And I said, well, uh, Fort Detrick um, could very well be, be the problem here, uh, not the solution. Soon thereafter, uh, within a few weeks, the FBI uh, authorized the destruction of the United States government's uh, collection of Ames strain anthrax uh, maintained out in uh, uh, Ames, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And that I, I was originally hired here to teach criminal law. That clearly was an obstruction of justice, uh, that you, you would be able to take those Ames strains and reconstruct uh, who, you know, precisely who was involved in this, um, uh, this attack. So it became very clear to me that the FBI, right from the get-go, uh, was involved in a uh, in a cover-up here of who really was behind uh, the anthrax attacks 
been basically the FBI has been lying uh, about it and, and covering it up. Uh, I don't believe Ivan did it. Even the people who work with him uh, don't believe uh, he did it. Again. And by the way, I should also point out Bowman was the same FBI guy who sabotaged the request by the FBI agents in Minneapolis, Rowley and the rest of them, mm -hmm. to get a um, subpoena into Musawi's computer. He was mm -hmm. the exact same guy. That's right. And Bowman had been ordered by someone to sabotage that um, subpoena uh, into uh, Musawi's computer. Uh, the argument that the FISA court, uh, there wasn't enough evidence, that is total baloney. If you study everything about uh, Musawi, there was more than enough evidence for the FISA court to issue a FISA warrant uh, into, his, into his computer. Later on, then, Bowman was promoted and given an award. If, if we find out you know, who was really behind the anthrax attacks, perhaps we'll find out who really was behind 9-11.